Today we are delighted to be at Collective Warehouse here in London, where the company stocks more than 20,000 dresses. In the last three years, Collective has grown 35 to 50 percent year on year, and much of this growth is due to the global reach of the brand, both in terms of suppliers, wholesale and retail customers. Welcome to Collective. Let's go and have a walk around. Okay, so just here we have the showroom, and that's the owner of the company through there, having a meeting with our UK production factory. If we come through here, we have the design and development team. This is Demi, who's recently joined the company, has a lot of experience working with lots of other brands, and is going to help us to continue to develop the collection. We have Julia, our head designer, as well as many other things. And we have Kat, who is in charge of product development and brings more of the technical elements, as well as doing quality control for the business. And we have Neymar here, our lovely graphics intern. This is where I sit. And this is our accounts team, Yogi and Michelle. If you'd like to follow me into the warehouse. Okay, so this is the wholesale department. We have Amin here, who's in charge of wholesale operations. And Francesca, who's in charge of customer service. So if you're a shop anywhere in the world and you buy from Collective, these guys are talking to. This is where all the goods come in. We receive between one and three metric tons by air per week as well as sea shipments. And these boxes here are all ready to go out today to shops that we supply around Europe and the rest of the world. Here we have Thomas, the warehouse manager, and uh, various members of his team here. Chicho and down there as well, the lovely Pablo. They'll love me calling him lovely. <laughs> We go over to the other side of the warehouse. Down on the right here is some uh, old stocks, uh, which are not currently stocked within the collection and we sell via our eBay store. And down here we have Vanya and Siobhan. And Vanya is in charge of retail operations, so it's her job to make sure that when one of our lovely customer, retail customers orders something from our website, that it gets to them as soon as possible. And if they wish to return it, that they get their money back as soon as possible because we want happy customers. Which brings us on, on to Siobhan, who's in charge of customer service and social media. Communicating with our customers is what we try to do most and she's incredibly good at it. So over here we have Juliet, who's currently making sure that the orders that have been placed from yesterday are going out the door and it looks like it was a good day. And last but by no means least, we have Luca here, who is our store development manager and ensures the right stock is in the right store at the right time and that the shop looks fantastic, which it always does. Thank you very much. I'm joined by John Alston, Managing Director of Collective. John, thank you so much for showing us around. Could you please tell us a little bit more about Collective and how the company started uh, 14 years ago? Of course. Um, Collective started off importing uh, from the Far East alternative clothing, particularly punk and gothic styles. Uh, Fourteen years ago, Ramiro Torres, the owner and founder of Collective, emigrated from Ecuador to London. He started a small store in Camden Stables Market and in the same year attended the first London Edge trade show ever, and, uh, which, which, is, which we still attend today. The brand has grown from strength to strength since then, but that was mostly because of several years ago, Ramiro attended a trade show in the US and saw the emerging uh, niche trend of 1940s and 50s reproduction vintage and was one of the first to bring it to the UK. So with that new niche, the company really started to take shape and, and really, really sort of grow. Um, since then, we now have five stores, four of which are in London. We're in Camden Stables Market still to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in Spitalfields Market, Covent Garden, Stoke Newington, and most recently we've opened in Brighton. Not only have we been growing between 35 and 50% year on year, that the 50% growth, that's been within the last five, six months, and that 
our development is not down to a big cash investor coming in. It's not down to a big loan from the bank. It's happened organically. And it's, you know, from a lot of hard work, from not taking a lot of money out of the business, reinvesting it back into the business and developing it across lots of different areas. You know, um, we believe there's safety in that, just the same as with our wholesale clients. We don't, we're not every day chasing the big department stores. If one of them wanted to come along, then we may be very interested in talking to them, but it's not an active part of our strategy. We work with lots of independents all over the world and uh, we spread risk. We do also take risks, but they're, they're from uh, analytics and, and they're from um, the research that we do. So one important thing with our continued growth uh, is that the best takings that our stores have, have ever had have been in the last two months. Our two fl flagship stores are our store in Camden Stables Market, which reflects the main line um, of Collective, the more alternative side of our label and the roots of the brand. The other store is in Old Spitalfields Market, and that is more of the flagship for Collective Vintage. And Collective Vintage uh, is not a more commercial version of our brand. It's not aimed to be a high street brand. It's aimed to appeal to a wider audience. Because if you start using taglines like those that I mentioned previously, then you risk losing the heart and the soul of the brand and what has been built up over many, many years. And that's something that we do not want and that we've had feedback from the shops that stock our product. They don't want that either. And neither do our customers on Facebook. And, you know, it's that constant conversation, that constant engagement with the shops that stock us, the online websites that stock us, and our actual end customer that is educating us. And we're learning all of the time and we'll continue to learn and to listen to what other people are doing, to listen to what the industry are doing and even what other industries are doing and see how we can apply that to what we do and try things out. So not everything always works for everyone. Every business is different. But uh, through that trial and error process is, uh, and, and constantly moving ourselves forward, challenging ourselves and sometimes making mistakes, but on the whole, so far, we've managed to avoid any big ones and to continue to grow. That, that's how we're growing our business. So how does your, the company operate from uh, design, manufacturing, production to international sales? Everything is designed in the UK. We start off with lots of research. We regularly, um, our staff in particular, the designer, will visit uh, vintage stores both in London and in other locations, keeping an eye as well on current fashion trends, reports from WGSN and Drapers. Uh, we visit international trade shows. But the important thing with the more fashion-led element of our, our brand, which we've now split into a separate label, is that we are trend-influenced but not trend-led. Mm -hmm. We have our own style. We try to be as different as we can and to maintain what the company has built up over the last 14 years uh, but we want to appeal to a wider audience and that's why we've launched the collective vintage label away from the main line just to do just that very good so you will be speaking at the UKTI uh, international business theater at pure uh, London in August um, could you please tell us a little bit more about how collective has built an international brand uh, online well, two big buzzwords of the moment are multi-channel and omni-channel. <laughs> and we really are a multi-channel business. We sell in our retail stores. We sell online retail. We sell online wholesale. We attend trade shows and take orders there. We take orders for wholesale customers in our showroom and we go around Europe to visit our customers as well. Mm. So there's that and then also more recently, we sell on other platforms, such as ASOS Marketplace. We've been on there for around two years. We also sell um, on eBay, which is to clear overstocks. We will never uh, sell anything on there which conflicts with our current season or any products that our stockists may have, um, but it's a useful tool. 
And most recently, uh, we are in the process of going live on Amazon. And it's important not to be afraid of platforms like Amazon, because in the past, many brands and many retailers have seen, this is definitely not for us. This is, you know, where you, where you buy CDs, records, and, <laughs> and TVs. Yes. It's not where you buy clothes. Well, to my knowledge, uh, in Germany, for instance, more people buy clothing on Amazon than any other platform online. Mm. And uh, a few weeks ago, Amazon launched a new section of their website called the Dress Edit, uh, which utilizes uh, new ways of displaying clothes that are completely unique to there. And what I believe is potentially one of the future technologies of, of how clothes will be sold online. Um, so, yeah, it's the perfect time for us to, to join in with that. And I'm sure lots of other brands will and lots of other brands already have. So where are you exporting to at the moment and where do you plan to expand the business in the next two or three years? Okay, so in the UK, the UK market represents 32% uh, of our sales online and is a, a good example of the, the fact that the rest of it is all international. And that's not just to one country. We haven't just targeted all our efforts in, into one. It's spread across many. So number two, which accounts for over 20%, is to the Netherlands. We also sell 17% to the Germany, and then it goes down through Australia, Finland, France, Switzerland, Sweden, Belgium, Italy, and the United States. So almost all around the world. So, <laughs> exactly, and for, we, we are not a big company. We're not a huge company. We are a company that's growing, and we are selling all over the world, and our aim has been to make that as easy as possible uh, for our customers to do, and we must be doing something right in that <laughs> avenue to, to be stocked in so many countries. So how do you overcome the challenges of dealing with uh, international distributors? Okay. Um, one aspect of that is our online wholesale platform. Mm -hmm. that, was, that has been instrumental in the success of the company as a whole and particularly internationally. Uh, this platform was bespokely designed in-house by myself and the team and developed by a third-party web development company. And what that's allowed us to do is we, we need to hold stock anyway to supply our own stores mm -hmm. um, and for our online retail. What that allows us is to hold even more stock and to have a lot more th throughput of stock um, because, as you say, we have 20,000 uh, dresses in stock at any one time. It's actually 35,000 items or uh, individual items, of which uh, between five and 7,000 are accessories and the, and the rest are clothing items. And you just need to go to our website, create an account, prove that you are a legitimate business, and then with a low minimum spend, you can place your orders 24 hours of the day, seven days a week, and that area of the website is specifically designed to make it as easy as possible for a shop to stock our product. So they can download all of our images in high resolution. And that also helps to protect our brand and to protect, protect the way that we are presented. Uh, because if you make it easier for someone to use your own images, which show the product exactly the way we want to show it, then they're more likely to use them. And that will help with our consistency. Um, the other thing is delivery. If you order from our website and you're based in the UK, 90% of the time, provided it's not at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you will receive that order the very next day. If it's within Europe, you'll receive it within two to three days. And if it's in America or Australia or the rest of the world, it should, should not be any more than seven days. So what we're, what we're aiming to do which is so important for independent retailers, is for them to not to have to put in a huge forward order months and months and months in advance. It can be a lot more flexible for them. They can all, you know, invest in the coats when you need coats, not order them and then have them turn up in mm. July, which you know, is not ideal. We're a short order business. We do offer forward order as well, but predominantly, giving independent retailers that flexibility 
um, we found it has been what is very helpful for them. And they can put a forward order in, then put a larger uh, short order in at the beginning of the season or mid-season. And then what they can do, the best sellers, they can then go back onto our website and just top up what they need. Another key thing is we don't sell in packs as most wholesale companies and brands do. Uh, we allow our customers to pick and choose each individual size and the quantities for each size that they need. Because as having worked in the retail previously, if you've bought a pack and you've got sizes 10 to size 18, and you sell out of the 10 and the 12 very quickly, you then don't want to buy another pack that's mm. full of 16s or, or whatever, mm. or sixes or whatever the, the lower selling uh, size is. And that's another important thing for us, actually, of, of why I think has contributed to, to us doing well, is the fact that we stock from a size 6 to a size 22. Now, I'm not going to say that we massively over-order in, in the, the larger sizes or, or the smaller ones, but just by having those sizes. Those customers out there have been victimized by the high street and by many other brands. And in, in my opinion, you know, they are, they are the ones that shout the loudest and have the most reason to shout. So by keeping that customer happy, it's helped to build a lot of brand loyalty for our brand because of the size range that we do, the fact that all of our fabrics have 2% stretching. So if anything in a collective dress or, or top or whatever it is, you're going to be going down a size. You're never going to be going up a size. Excellent. So for people who will be watching this video, what is your number one tip for long-term success overseas? Well, the simplest way is to make it as easy as possible for your customer to purchase. An example of how we're growing our US market is that all of the prices on our wholesale website for the US include shipping and duty already, because that's a big factor. If you're, if you're trusting a company that's on the other side of the world to you. Um, because you see all these prices, but you don't know how much at the end it's going to cost to send those boxes over, how many items are going to fit in each box, and am I going to be landed with a big duty bill at the end of it? So for the US, we decided to adjust the prices so everything is included, so the price that they see is the price that they get. So that's one way of making it easy. Um, we try to make the biggest impact we can as possible online, and at trade shows and in our stores. One of the things that we're planning to do is to further grow the US market and we are going to be opening a store on the west coast of America. And the main reason for opening a store there is because 12 months ago, Brighton was not in our top 10 cities for online sales in the world. It wasn't even in the top 20. It's now number two after London since the store has opened. So, and that is not just, that's nothing to do with the store, store actual sales. It's to do with the sales that have happened through our website because the store is there. So we're a big believer in the fact that you can't just have an online presence. You've got to have a physical presence as well. And there are lots of pure play online retailers that are now starting to take that approach with my wardrobe and other mm. uh, people starting to open pop-up stores and then... Uh, more substantial bricks and mortar stores and um, that's what that's what we're doing and we've got the analytics and the proof to back it up you know we do a lot of research in what we do we do surveys continuously on our facebook page we've grown our facebook page from 12,000 likes to 38,000 likes <laughs> in 12 months yeah. and that's not through chucking a load of money at it it's from you know real content Growing internationally is just, and growing a brand is a combination of everything. And for us as well, as I say, uh, my, uh, my past uh, career was working for a retailer selling, a multi-brand retailer selling brands at the higher end of the industry. And uh, I think an important thing for everyone to look at is that whether you are a brand or whether you are selling brands, you are still a brand. And building that, making that as strong as possible, and getting it out there on channels like uh, your own website, like other platforms, is going to help to build that brand and build it internationally. Well, John, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Absolute pleasure.